Hey guys, this is John. All right, I'm playing a dual commentary today, a little match against one of my former students. He opens with e4. What to throw at him? Let's play the Sicilian. Okay, so this is my former student, Howard, from Norway. He is known as the Norwegian chess giant on YouTube and Twitch. Uh, really good guy. I actually met up with him in Oslo uh, when I was there back in October. So that was cool to meet him in person for the first time. So he is also recording this match. We're going to play two games, two games of 15 plus 10. And yeah, it'll be dual commentary, so you can check out both perspectives. So he's not going for the open Sicilian. He's playing c3, queen c2. Now, Howard, he does he does experiment in the opening. So I wasn't expecting something completely mainline. This doesn't look all that dangerous for black, but you know, this is a, a possible way of continuing, I suppose. Queen c2, I think, is a little unnecessary given that I wasn't threatening to take that pawn because of queen a4 check. Typical fork. So, usually in these anti-Sicilians, I try to fianchetto the dark square bishop. But I'm just seeing if, if it makes more sense to play something else, like knight c6 first, perhaps. Yeah, actually, I think I will play knight c6. I want to see how he reacts to that. Just trying to control d4 a little bit better. And also that's a hedge against e5 in case he wants to push that pawn. If bishop b5, I think I'll just break the pin with bishop d7. So yeah, two games of 15 plus 10. Uh, we've played before, but only in blitz. Actually, when I met up with him, it was at the train station in Oslo. And he came all the way down from uh, the northern part of Norway just to like hang out with me for an hour or two, which is really cool of him. And uh, we played a bunch of Blitz in the train station, but no games longer than that. So this will be interesting. Howard is quite, quite dangerous when he gets the initiative. So, you know, <laughs> I've, I've faced lots of players like that, especially in some of these dual commentaries. So hopefully if he if he does start to get going with the initiative, I can wrest it away away from him. So bishop b5 pinning my knight. I'm just going to break that pin. I'm definitely okay with the trade here. I don't have to mess up my pawn structure if he does decide to swap. I might play a6 on the next move. Let's just assume he castles. Uh, I could go for a6, but I could also play either g6 or e6 and try to get this dark square bishop out and just kind of keep the status quo here. One thing is... With his queen on c2, when I play a6, if he retreats to a4, he would run into b5, bishop b3, c4. Because he doesn't have the c2 retreat like you would in a Ruy Lopez, for instance. So I don't know about bishop b5. I don't like that move for white, personally. Okay, he does castle. So a6 immediately, or something else. Just wondering about the line a6, bishop takes c6, bishop takes c6, e5. That looks critical. Takes, knight takes. And then he's on my bishop. It'd be nice to play something like queen d5 there. He takes on c6, I take back. I think I'm fine there, although I have to give the bishop pair back in that case. But I should also keep in mind that he might play d4 if given the chance. So maybe a6 is good to try to discourage that. Like, say I play e6, can he just play d4 is a key question. And I think the answer is yes, he could. So, all right, a6, bishop takes c6, bishop takes c6, e5. Also, bishop takes f3 there. Yeah, bishop takes f3 is interesting. He takes on f6, bishop back, takes e7, take with the bishop. That should also be good. I think I'm going to go with a6. And if he wants to keep the bishop, he'll have to go to a square that, to me, looks suboptimal. c4, I can think about b5. And again, there's no bishop b3 because of c4. d3 doesn't look right. Uh, blocks his d-pawn, so maybe e2 is the best square if he wants to keep the bishop. But that blocks his rook down the e-file. I think I'll be pretty happy. Again, though, he could try for d4. Maybe I'll, I'll think about rook c8 if he does that. Further discourage the c-pawn push. Line up my rook with his queen. I 
I was expecting him to open with e4 in this game. He mostly plays e4. I've seen him occasionally play d4 with white, but yeah, he tends to be a king pawn player. Okay, he, he does go back to e2. And here I think this rook c8 move is appropriate. Yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time thinking about that one because if I were him, the next move I'd want to play by far is d4. So let's just make sure if he does that, I can take. And then he'll lose a pawn because he can't recapture due to knight takes d4. With math massive problems if that happens. My knight will get into c2 at the minimum. You'll recall I played a match like this against another one of my students, uh, Patrick, uh, several months back, which was a lot of t a lot of fun. So this is cool to do again. Plays d3. So do I go for the fianchetto or something in the center? The position's pretty quiet right now. Just again debating between these pawn pushes. In general, I like that bishop on the long diagonal whenever possible. So. Yeah, I think I'm going to go for this. And white's setup just looks passive to me. I don't think he's worse or anything, but he hasn't been able to achieve anything in the center. I think I've already equalized. A logical completion of development for him is bishop out, just as he did, and then knight to d2. I think that's quite likely. So I'm going to go here, and let's see if he does bring that knight out. e5 would be premature. If he does that, I can come to uh, h5 or d5 with my knight, hit his bishop, and then I'll have three attackers on the e5 pawn. So I think it's likely he'll just play knight bd2 here, all castle, and then we'll head to the middle game with a full board of pieces. I'm really glad we were able to make this match happen because I had a power outage this morning. My internet was down for a while. Also yesterday I tried to stream I streamed the chess.com uh, Arena Kings Bullet week one, and my computer was just struggling the whole time. <laughs> the fan was going super loud, uh, and then right at the end of the tournament, my stream got interrupted because Windows decided to restart. <laughs> Windows 10 was like, you need a restart, and it popped up, and I was in the middle of a bullet game with Grandmaster Georg Meyer, like super tense position, and I clicked the wrong button. I was trying to click restart later and I clicked restart now <laughs> so my computer restarted stream went dead obviously I lost that game uh, it didn't really matter for the standings or anything but it was a, a funny and frustrating way to end the stream okay rookie one just gonna castle no reason to think about anything else I suspect he's gonna play bishop f1 and I think he's getting ready for e5 so assuming bishop f1 is played uh, just already starting to brainstorm moves. Bishop g4 is interesting, although then just knight bd2. I've mentioned how if you have a fianchetto bishop, typically you don't want to deploy your other bishop to the same side of the board. So bishop g4. Problem is, unless I'm taking his knight and messing up his pawns, whenever he plays h3, he'll be chasing that bishop, and I can't go to h5 because of g4 trapping it. You don't have the g6 square available with the fianchetto, so. So I think on bishop f1, e5 is definitely a strong candidate move. Um, maybe b5 if I want to invite him to play this. Because I actually think, yeah, I could play knight, a5, uh, knight h5 even there, attacking the bishop. Okay, he just plays knight bd2 immediately. So I kind of feel like I don't want to take any decision in the center yet. Uh, knight h5 here when I'm not prompted, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because of just this. Although, admittedly, I can then think about knight d4, which is interesting. This is a theme with my rook lined up with his queen. 
So yeah, actually e5 could be interesting right here. e5 or knight h5. e5 would block my bishop, but it enhances my control over d4 significantly. But yeah, there's some downsides. I mean, it creates a weakness on d6 for sure. Can also just play b5. Just start expanding on the queen side. So those are my three main candidate moves. Knight h5, e5, or b5. Hmm. Leaning towards e5. Changes the nature of the play a bit strategically, but it makes a lot of sense in my eyes. If e5, bishop g5, I'll play h6, and I might even chase him. Bishop h4, I might play g5. Yeah, let's go for it. I'll try to keep my time edge as well. Usually that's a losing battle for me, but you never know. <laughs> And if bishop g3, knight h5 beckons. And he could bring his bishop to h4. I'll probably move my queen. Uh, but then the f4 square is weak. I might be able to use that. And I think that last decision, whether to play e5 or not, uh, that's a decision I think I could have gone with any of those three moves. And I'm trying my best not to hem and haw over those those similar decisions. I think they were all good. But what did I spend on that move? I spent a minute 54 seconds. That's probably too long. I wish I could cut that down to maybe a minute. Even in a 15 plus 10, I think that's a little too long. He seems a little timid here dare I say, with his opening setup. When we were playing in the train station, he was going after me uh, more aggressively. <laughs> okay, h6. If he takes, I think I'll take with the bishop, maybe the queen. Yeah, actually, maybe queen. He can try for this maneuver, though, and then plopping his knight on d5. So I might not want my queen here if that knight ever lands on that square. Yeah, I think bishop takes is more appropriate. Yeah, I'll take with the bishop. And then if knight c4, I think I'm going to play bishop here to guard d6. Ah, and then if knight e3, I have that same knight d4 idea, don't I? I can still go for that. I think it works because of take, take. If the knight comes back to c4, I have b5 using the pin. And I will regain the piece with probably, yeah, probably decent chances there. So I have the bishop pair. However, the position is closed right now. All the pawns are on the board. There's no open lines. I think the, the position could become open later for the bishops. That's what I'm banking on, especially a future f5 break. But for now, I don't think this bishop pair confers that much of an advantage. So this is kind of an investment in my uh, future of this game, hopefully. Yeah, I think knight c4 is the most logical here, but he plays a4 instead, okay. So evidently he doesn't want me to play b5. He's just trying to stake control over some queenside space. So here I think bishop e6 is a strong candidate move, as is b5. But maybe I want to wait. Maybe I want to wait for him to play knight c4 in order to play b5. I think there's certainly an argument to be made for that. 
So yeah, in the interest of being practical again, I'm going to play this. I think it's just a totally normal move. And my tentative plan is if knight c4, then play b5. And let's assume a trade happens, knight e3. I'm even in a better situation to play knight d4 than before. Take, take. If his knight comes back to c4, if you can visualize that through this mess of arrows, my pawn's already on b5, so I can take him. And that should produce a somewhat favorable pawn structure. I will have double d pawns, but uh, my dark square bishop in particular could be strong later. Also have pressure against c4 and maybe b2. And also playing a move like this quickly just challenges your opponent to come up with something. I mean, he's already four minutes behind on the clock, so maybe I can keep him thinking. Hard to see what else he should do other than play knight c4. Honestly, it's it's hard to find a plan because, I mean, this is the problem with the knight pair versus the bishop pair, or bishop and knight even versus two bishops, is that you're always going to be hesitant to open the position. Everything else being equal, opening the position should favor the bishops. So it's like he wants to come up with some sort of plan here, and because this is trench warfare, the pieces aren't really in contact with each other, most of the good plans are going to revolve around pawn breaks. But... I mean, d4 is not happening. I've got four of my pieces and pawns trained on that square. Uh, b4 is not happening. So, yeah, the pawn breaks are not looking great for him. And his pieces can't really maneuver to ideal squares. Like, his knights would love to have better squares than what they currently have on offer. Like, d5 is really my only weakness. And, you know, I just mentioned what I'm going to try to do against that plan of him getting his knight in there. Even if he does get his knight in there, it's not the end of the world for me. I might just swap and give him doubled pawns. So, yeah, I don't see a clear way forward for him. And what will I do if given the chance? I think I'll definitely think about playing b5, even if the knight is not on c4, but I like my bishop here. Stop stuff like queen b3, I just have a lot of influence on this diagonal. I might also prepare b5, like maybe I don't have to go for it right away. Okay, he plays knight f1. I wonder if he's going for the square, but just in uh, a different way. So for sure I could play b5. The only thing I have to take into consideration is if after a trade of the pawns, he can make use of the a-file. There's nothing on the a-file, but a move like rook e6 comes to mind for sure. So maybe I don't want to play b5 yet. Maybe I make a semi-waiting move here and just see if he goes for knight e3. I mean, I think a useful move would be bishop back to g7, is that frees up f5. So let's see, bishop g7, knight e3, knight d4. Take, take, knight c4, again that b5 move. See, that version I don't know if I like as much, because after a trade he gets a chance to play b3. That's going to produce a pawn structure that's better than that other line I mentioned. So I'm kind of on the fence about that one. I could also think about d5. If I just want to get rid of this backward pawn, like that's definitely a strong consideration. d5, let's say, takes. Uh, suppose I take with the bishop. Knight e3. Maybe bishop back to e6. He has knight c4, but I can kick that knight out pretty quickly. Okay, so yeah, that's that's a serious con consideration as well, d5. So d5 or bishop g7, those are my main moves right here. b5, I'm just not liking as much. I would have been more likely to play b5 against that knight c4 move because it came with tempo, but I just don't really see what to do against this and then rook a6. It's, it's kind of annoying. Yeah, I think I'm going to play d5. Get rid of that weakness. See if he wants to trade this pawn on e4. 
Because also, after this trade happens, I take with the bishop. If his knight comes to e3, I feel like he's really blocked up on the e-file. He'd perhaps like to attack e5, which now doesn't have a pawn defender, but he's got so many pieces stacked here, it's not going to be easy. And again, as a general consideration, I was talking about the bishop pair. It's a pawn break. It opens up the position a little bit. Should favor me. He does take. Any reason to take with a queen here? I could think about queen takes, knight e3, queen b3, offering a queen trade, but nah, I don't like that as much. He's already becoming a little cramped, so I want to keep the queens on the board. Knight e3 again, knight d4 comes into consideration, but it's the same thing. Take, take, knight c4, b5, take, take. I don't like that he has b3 at the end. So let's just back this guy off. And this is hovering, but again, maybe b5 and renew the threat, knight d4. I think he might move this knight to d2 and try to look at some of these squares with that knight. But that's where a future f5 could really hamper his play. Just deny him the e4 square. But I need to get my bishop out of the way first. So maybe bishop here or here. Probably g7. That feels more secure. Although then I'm not guarding c5. On e7 I would be guarding c5. But I like that bishop next to my king guarding h6. So I think on knight d2 that's what I'm going to do. Let's say knight d2, bishop g7, knight e4, hitting c5. Maybe just queen e7. Okay, he plays queen d2. I think he was feeling some of the pressure here down this file. So understandable move. But he takes away a square from this knight. So I immediately look at ways I can somehow take advantage of this. I mean, if my pawn were on g5, g4 would trap this piece. e4 doesn't work because take, and he's covering this knight. Again, yeah, maybe just bishop g7. I don't see a reason not to play that move. Yeah, and also, it makes sure that if he moves this knight, queen takes h6 won't be any trouble. Don't think I have to rush b5 here. Look briefly at this and then knight e5, but trying to remove the defender of his queen, but he can just take on d8. It's no problem. So, all right, let's go here. Tentative idea of f5. Yeah, I definitely like my position. Ah, also, I'm just noticing now knight a5 is more of an idea now that uh, his queen is not on c2. So I'd be threatening to come in b3 with a fork. So I should keep that in mind as well. I wish I would have noticed that before playing bishop g7. Even so, though, I don't think I would have played knight a5 directly. But that could be handy. I mean, bishop g7, for many of you, might be a move that you wouldn't really consider because it is a retreating move. In some ways, it looks kind of passive, but it's mostly for prophylactic purposes. So this bishop is now very secure next to my king. My queen doesn't have to babysit it. It's out of range of his knights, so you know he can't ever jump up to like e4 or later g4 or something and attack it. Defends h6, just like a nice sturdy move in the absence of something more concrete, and there's no reason for me to rush this position. It's gradually open, opening up, and I don't see much counterplay for him. So I can totally afford to make a move like that. I was seeing some interesting ideas if he plays knight c4. I could definitely play b5, but I could also think about uh, bishop takes c4, d takes c4, e4, which nearly wins a piece again. He'd have to trade queens, 
and let's say I take back, and then his knight has to go to h4, and he has doubled pawns. I don't have the bishop pair anymore, but that looks pretty awkward for him. My rook can come down to d2, maybe my knight can go to e5. Stuff like that starts to look good. So he's now getting very low on time here in the middle game, 2 minutes and 30 seconds. So this is where I want to try to capitalize. And you don't want to intentionally uh, play reckless moves in a situation like this, just hoping, hoping to confuse your opponent. But I might uh, err on the side of aggression and mudding the waters within reason. Okay. I also might try to play um, some sort of line I've calculated, but play a few of the moves rapid fire instead of pausing in between moves like I usually do, just to keep him on the clock. Like I think that's a valid strategy too when your opponent's in time pressure. But again, you don't want to be reckless. You don't want to just lose all sense of objectivity and strictly play for the clock because, again, this is 10-second increment. If it was no increment, okay, but yeah, 10 seconds, you can still make a good decision in 10 seconds. Yeah, he really has to move here, but I think he just doesn't see a good plan. Nor do I. I mean, I think he should play something solid here, but... Even centralizing a rook has some issues, like bishop b3 would be the answer, perhaps, to rook a d1. Also, I could just play f5, continue with my plan if I want. Maybe bishop f1. Bishop f1 looks logical. I mentioned that he has all these pieces stacked on the file. Okay, yeah, he plays something similar, sort of a waiting move, h3. That does give his knight h2 now. So maybe he's looking to maneuver it via that square. Okay, so candidate moves here. f5, uh, knight a5, b5, I think again. Just on sight alone, I think f5 is the move that appeals to me most. It slightly weakens my king side, because I'll have moved all of these pawns around my king, but... My dark square bishop does such a great job of protecting the king, and he's not in a position to exploit that. I mean, adding a little more oomph to an e4 push is pretty tempting, even though I don't think I'm strictly threatening e4. Uh, knight a5 as well. Yeah, I don't know. Feels like he can maybe just sidestep, maybe queen back to c2 there. I'm not completely sure. I think I like f5 a little bit more. I'm going to play that move. Just expand. It's possible he'll even have to consider f4 in some positions. It's probably not a great move because it surrenders the e4 square, but the fact that both of these pawn moves are now something that white has to take into account, that'll encourage him to burn this valuable time. And I will mercilessly flag one of my own students. I'm not above that. <laughs> I never pull any punches. Okay, knight f1. So he voluntarily retreats. Yeah, that does help defend his queen again. Okay, yeah, I don't see anything super productive by moving one of these guys. Could just move my queen, like maybe queen d6, something like that. Then I lose sight of this square, don't I? A little bit. Knight a5, I think he'll play bishop d1. And then he's, he is attacking e5 at that point. Actually, queen d6 looks pretty reasonable here. Yeah, let's play that. I don't think knight h4 is really anything to worry about. I can always just play king h7. Or maybe move my bishop so that the queen is laterally guarding. So I like this. It's, again, more prophylaxis. Just defends some potentially weak points. Maybe gets ready for rook d8. I think a plan like this, move the knight over here, makes a lot of sense. 
I, I know I said I was going to do something with this, but I don't see any good breaks. It's more so that these pawns are just controlling a lot of squares at the moment. Okay, so he's super low. He's got to move. Five seconds. Make a move. <laughs> okay. Got knight h2 off just in time. So again, looking at knight a5. Looking at just rook over. I don't really get the purpose of this move. I mean, he was so low, he probably just played it simply to play it. Uh, I think I'm just going to play rook here. Throw the move back at him. At bishop f3, I can then play e4. It's a big consideration there. Yeah, and he does play bishop f3. I can also just win the d3 pawn, can't I? I just win that outright. e4 is a little more flashy. Uh, yeah, actually, both moves are really good. So e4, if he takes, I take on d2. We get a trade. Yeah, he doesn't have enough compensation there. So e4, probably he'll play bishop e2 or d1, but yeah, either way, it doesn't look good. It does not look good for him. Okay, I'm going to play e4. So f5 turned out to be useful in assisting in this pawn advance. Okay, he's going to sack a piece. Probably he'll take on f5 now, but I'm not seeing the compensation. Don't think it's enough. b2 is weak. Yeah, he just resigned. Okay. So Howard experienced serious time pressure issues. I'm going to briefly recap this game. Uh, what's funny is I'm using a keyboard because my main cube keyboard was malfunctioning. So I'm using a backup keyboard I have, and I can't hit the forward arrow. <laughs> I like spilled a drink or something on it a while back, and I can't hit the forward arrow anymore. So I'm just going to have to click around on the moves here. Um... Yeah, so I wasn't really impressed by this queen c2 idea. Because again, I'm not threatening to take on e4 due to queen a4 check with the fork on the king and the knight. So that's not something he has to worry about. Um, White has played a couple moves here. Bishop e2 followed by castling is logical. There's bishop d3, the Kopec system, with the idea of bishop c2 and then later expanding with d4. You can even play h3. It's like a semi-waiting move. So queen c2, on the other hand, just not really impressed by that move. Um... Uh, Knight c6, bishop b5, bishop d7. And I think, given that he never took my knight, this just amounted to uh, a slight waste of time. So when I played a6, he, I believe, correctly kept the bishop. But now it's like I got an a6 for free. He could have just put that bishop there immediately on e2 instead of taking a detour to b5. And a6, that's a move that's always helpful, helpful for black and the Sicilian. This move, I think, is instructive. Again, so if d4 takes, I'm ready to exploit this problem down the C file for him, like so. Yeah, and we got into this middle game. I see this sort of setup a lot. I think a lot of players on the white side of the Sicilian just do some kind of slow developments like this, maybe along the lines of, um, I don't know, like a D3 Italian game. But the problem is, in a lot of these middle games, you just don't have a great plan for white because you don't have enough space. You passed up earlier opportunities maybe to play D4. If you don't get in d4 and the Sicilian is white, um, I don't know. I, I think in theory, black should not experience any problems. And in some cases, black might be better. So where did it start to go wrong for him? I mean, I think I'm already a little bit better once I get the bishop pair. Perhaps, maybe instead of knight bd2, he should consider playing h3. This sort of London system-like move where he can tuck the bishop on h2 and keep it on this diagonal. That looks a little more tenacious to me. Because, yeah, getting that dark square bishop was really nice. You can see that once that happened, I kept mentioning how it's hard to find a plan for white. Perhaps he should try, to try for this maneuver immediately, but I was mentioning uh, some of the stuff with knight d4 that I was thinking about, so there's constantly this idea. Forking his queen and his bishop. And if he takes, then I've got the double attack here. Maybe he can consider playing these positions, though. 
Because this pawn structure, I think, is a lot better than if he would have to take with a D pawn and give me a protected pass D pawn. Still, I wouldn't mind playing this position for black because these pieces look pretty passive. But then again, my bishops aren't the greatest pieces right now. I mean, later, if this knight moves, maybe I play bishop g5, think about f5 stuff. Probably start with queen a5, rook over here, transfer the battle over to the queen side. Maybe he should do something like that because, yeah, I really think in a couple more moves... He's burning so much time, like this move knight f1, he spent two and a half minutes on. I spent almost the same amount of time deciding on d5, but yeah, by the time we got like this position here, he was under five minutes, and I felt like my moves were very easy. Again, prophylactic style moves, bishop g7, just making sure that the bishop's secure, this pawn's protected, make way for the f-pawn. If you notice your opponent's playing passive, but you don't see anything concrete, like, for sure, don't feel like you have to force anything or rush anything. Just slowly increase the pressure on their position, make useful moves. That's what I was looking to do. F5, you know, I mentioned he has to continue looking at these pawn advances at all times. Doesn't even matter if they're not good. Like, that's just another cognitive load for him when he's already in time pressure. Uh, also moves like queen d6, just preparing rook d8. That turned out to be very helpful because he was kind of fiddling with his knights and he ran smack dab into e4. So bishop f3 was a straight blunder, but yeah, it's hard to um, hard to offer advice. I mean, I think he should move his queen, probably. Maybe queen back to c2, but it's really, it's a nasty position. Black is clearly better here. But queen c2, he's very much in the game. It's just I don't see a whole lot of ways he can develop these sort of pieces, do anything meaningful with them. He really got himself in a bind there with the knights. And once I play e4, he should probably do something like bishop d1. And then if I take, and I'm looking for stuff like this, or maybe through e5, um, it should just be winning for black, but at least he has this blockaded. He's only down one pawn. Yeah, I think as played, he did resign a little early, but he's not going to get enough compensation. Let's say take. I take with the bishop. He has two pawns for the piece, but I have a great deal of activity. Again, this knight doesn't look impressive. And this is winning for black. Okay, so that was game one. I'm going to stop this recording and fire up game two where we will switch colors. All right, thanks for watching, guys. And again, this is a dual commentary. I will link Howard's commentary down below so you can go check it out on his channel. All right, bye, guys.